Welcome to Rock Shop Talk. Our show talks best practices, fun anecdotes, and the latest cutting edge technology in our field to kick your screen printing gears into hyperdrive. Today's episode, the topic of foil, special effects, and simulated process and screen printing. And we're joined by our special guest, John Weiss of New Buffalo Shirt. Thank you all who tuned in to last week's episode on diversity and inclusion in decorated apparel. We need your help in choosing a hashtag that meets the call to action this moment in history deserves. Please email us at hello at rock.us with your ideas. We're stoked that the Rock U.S. Tour bus is quickly getting ready for our first U.S. tour. To follow the tour and even reserve a visit when we come through your town, follow us on hashtag RockUSTourOnline. We'll be right back. As more women enter and lead the screen printing industry, we're thrilled to give credit where credit is due. Hashtag Women Rock is all about putting a much overdue and much deserved spotlight on the women who are rocking this industry and who are constantly innovating and changing the game for us to learn from and follow. To join the movement with our inclusive group, please search hashtag Women Rock, that's R-O-Q, on Facebook. To nominate someone for the first ever Women in Screen Printing Awards, for which we are proud to sponsor, please visit screenweb.com slash womenprint. All right, so I want to welcome everybody back. Today's episode features the topic of foil, special effects, simulated process, and screen printing. We're joined by our special guest, Mr. John Weiss of New Buffalo Shirt, alongside of our creative producer, Mr. Merrill Caps. I'm uh, Ross Hunter, Rock US President and General Manager. And uh, we're going to kind of kick this off and, and go into some questions and start a cool conversation. So I want to kind of get started, uh, John, um, telling the audience you know, about your background and, and more specifically, what got you into this industry some time ago? Yeah, well, you know what? I may be the oldest guy in the industry right now. Um, I, maybe not, maybe not, but close. Started uh, screen printing in 1968. Uh, you know, family business. My grandfather was from Eastern Europe came over here in the 40s. He was a sewer, um, got sponsored, got a job, moved to Buffalo. Uh, it's another story that doesn't really matter. Um, and, and really developed a company of doing chenille awards and then Swiss embroidery by hand and, and had all that going on. He was a bowler, so he got into the bowling uh, shirt decoration, you know, using chain stitch and all different types of embroidery methods. But, you know, as the market progressed in the 60s and screen printing became kind of, was pretty young back then, actually, you know, it was very young back then. Um, he wanted to get into screen printing and nobody knew how to do it. My father didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. At the time, I was 12. And I loved art. So I kind of started, you know, printing. And it was really funny because we were stretching real silk uh, with wood frames and rope. We were using indirect film. Uh, we were doing all our exposures with arc lamps. So it made it real easy as a 13-year-old to light cigarettes in the arc lamp. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and, you know, clean. Up was with the wonderful chemical xylene. So I probably, you know, years later, I, I, I had an issue with, uh, you know, xylene poisoning. But, uh, you know, it was, it was fun back then, you know. It was allowing me to still do art, but I was getting paid, you know, not very much, but getting paid to do it. So we, were, we actually learned on the fly. Our very first machine, because we were in the kind of, you'll love this one, Ross, kind of a big circle. Um, I started flocking, you know, flocking bowling shirts on a three up machine that you would clamp the shirt into the, the single screen, uh, leaded paint. Um, the single screen was on a, uh, on a rail. So I'd print one, then move the rail, print two, print three, flip the tables over, hit the electrostatic flocking thing. Flock was in a a tray at the bottom. It was filthy, you know, and I started flocking. I wish I had that machine at the, in the uh, screen printers museum for sure. 
Oh, yeah. um, so I started flocking. Uh, after I was flocking single color, it was close to 1970 at the time. I bought my very first Bass Tex and four color hand press, which had a shirt clamp down because back then we didn't even use spray tech, you know? Right. And in order to, there were no flash cure units. So we did a lot of water based main colors and, uh, and, uh, I trapped it all with plastisol. So it, it didn't build up and, and we started doing that, you know, uh, fast forward. And the business was local, radio stations, bars, pizzerias, not really very it, profitable. Was it a lot of t-shirts then, or was it more like button-up, bowling style? No, there were like, t-shirts. What, it, it was, but, okay. but, but at the time, in the 60s, there was no uh, distributors. Mm -hmm. So we would have an account set up with Union Underwear, which was Fruit of the Loom. And I remember I'd have to buy... Uh, underwear packs and I'd throw the underwear in one place and I'd take the t-shirts and print them you know when I got out of that building in 19 I don't even know 80 85 you know I threw out all the underwear you know and that's the only way we could we could get shirts we were lucky wow. enough there was a local guy there was actually a local t-shirt manufacturing here uh, about uh, 40 miles away and we were buying shirts from them but it was difficult to get shirts and, you know, there were no distributors, so you'd have to set up. Our first ink company was uh, the old, what do they call it, flexible products, you know, the old Wilflex. Hmm. Um, you know, because we started with air dry, kind of heavy leaded, uh, flock adhesive inks. Hmm. And then, you know, we got into the water bases. We got into the plastisols from Wilflex, uh, all that. And, you know, that's what I did. And it's very important for the... Uh, guests to this podcast understand that we're talking about starting in 1968 and 20 years later when we invented simulated process with dave gardner we became an overnight sensation it took 20 years to get to be an overnight sensation so the reason why i say that is because you can't come out of the gate and be a superstar you know and you right. can't really even think that that's going to be your business model so when you, you know, got through, sorry, you got through most of that through like testing and playing oh, and experimenting the limits, right, of, of what you could do with what was available at the time. My father was a salesman and, and he was awesome, but what he didn't understand, he, there was never no in his vocabulary. So I remember having to try and figure out how to print tennis balls. I remembered how oh, to wow. print on we made our own tabletop printer because Buffalo hosts the world's largest disco and they wanted a banner. And I had a screen print letters that might have been six feet tall. Wow. And we did it all by hand because he didn't really know how to say no. But, you know, through the uh, process, what my father did teach me is great work ethic and that nothing's impossible. So, uh, you know, we fast forward. Um, I took over the company, both companies, my father's and grandfather's company in 1987. Um, they weren't really very, very profitable. I bought my first automatic in 1986, and that was a four color aero multi printer. But I think it had 10 stations or something. So, you know what? We were getting into it because in order to get my company uh, out of debt and into a profitable situation when I took it over was. We had a contract print because we weren't very good at buying and there wasn't a lot of places you could buy from back then. Right. So uh, we started contract printing and, you know, I did that from 1986 to 1988 when the phone rang. I had an artist. This is a great story. So I had an artist. I sent her down to the local art store because everything we were doing, excuse me, at the time was letra set, hand cut, uh, Ruby list, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I was so cheap. I'd have her go down and buy maybe a sheet of format type. I'd take it into the dark room. I'd blow it up. I'd cut the letters apart. I'd wax them onto paper. That's how we did our designs, you know, very little film back then, you know, everything was really kind of done hand, hand done. Right. And one day I sent her off to the art store and the phone rang and I'm a Harley, uh, rider from way back. 
And uh, so a little segue, when Harley trademarked, I used to build my choppers by trading shirts to the local Harley dealership. <laughs> but when Harley nice. trademarked somewhere around 82, maybe 84, you know, we weren't the of the service the local Harley. They had to buy from mm -hmm. the big guys. And back then it was Hollaback Designs, 3D Emblem, and RK Stratman. Uh, so anyways, uh, you know, 1988 rolls around and I get a call from a guy and he said, can I talk to your art director? And I'm like, art director? Who a friggin' art director, you know? I mean, you're talking <laughs> to the owner. And he said, uh, he didn't tell me his name. And, and, and he said, well, I'm a young retired uh, t-shirt artist just uh, relatively just moved back to the area and I got your name from advance because you know what I come from a uh, an automated proposition and I'm looking to you know find somebody in town that might want to partner up and and through the conversation and, and and let me just backtrack when Harley became licensed and I used to go into the Harley dealership the owner of the Harley dealership used to say, you got to see these shirts, this, the, you know, and they were amazing. They were dimensional. It wasn't vector art, which was the only thing I was capable of doing. And they were amazing. And he said, you know, the guy's a local guy. So I'd pull a shirt down and read the signature and it was Dave Gardner. And you know what? They hated me at the dealership because I never bought a t-shirt, bought one, <laughs> you know, but I was just amazed because I was uh, looking at his work. He was underbasing in colors and, and, and it was fabulous, right? And right around that time, I'd say 84, 85, I read an article on a screen print magazine that said, you know what? Magic can happen when great technical people get together with great artists. So that was flying through the back of my head while well, I was listening to this guy kind of, I'm like, you're 32 years old and you're retired. Come on, give me a break, you know? But I did say through the course of the conversation, so where did you work? And he said, well, I was down in Fort Worth for a while. And most recently, I come from uh, a company in Wisconsin. And I said, say no more. Is your name Dave Gardner? And he said, yeah. And I said, oh, my God, I'm wearing one of your shirts. So he started oh, wow. asking me about what licenses I had. And I was laughing. I'm like, I don't have any licenses, you know. But I said, you know what? I'd love to meet you. So let's get together. And, and he came down. We were, I'm six years older than him. And he came down to my shop. And, uh, I, I, you know, we talked. And, and I really didn't have a proposition for him. But we did find out that we were huge sports fans, specifically Buffalo Bill sports fans. And I said, being as naive as I am, well, let's go get an NFL license, right? You know. I know a guy, he'll take us to New York. Right. So Dave said, okay, this is my proposition. And he told me how much it was gonna cost. And then he asked for a signing bonus. I was just a screen printer. I didn't have a whole lot of excess capital laying around. And he said, I want a signing bonus. So I went to a local credit union and borrowed $10,000 so I could give him a signing bonus. You know, That was going against absolutely nothing. Just to show <laughs> that I, Dave wanted to know that I was committed, you know, he's right, a smart guy. Right. So, uh, so he went home and at that particular time, the Raiders were in LA, not Oakland. And he went home and he took a photograph of himself, uh, put a bandana around his head, stuck a knife in his mouth and became a live version of the Oakland Raider or the LA Raider at the time. Took the picture, then took the picture, hand airbrushed it, separated it, which back then, took Dave about a week in a dark room because he was doing all exposure separations with Ruby lip and everything. And he comes waltzing into my place with film. By that time, I had already been doing a lot of work with Don Newman and, and working with roller frames. Mm -hmm. He told me how to, what inks to buy, told me how many strokes it each had to be. And we set up a job and it was very late at night, maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I inked up the screen and three shirts after, I was like, oh my Lord, I could not believe it. I was doing the work that I saw, you know, the Harley Davidson type of look uh, that I saw in the shop, you know, in the, in the shop. And I remember taking the shirt and, and it reminded me of, of Elvis on Velvet you know, Black Velvet, hmm. which thus the King of Black came from because Elvis was the King of Rock and Roll and I was doing this, so I so named myself the King of Black. 
and went home at two o'clock, two thirty in the morning, woke up my wife and said, I'm going to be a millionaire. We're going to be millionaires, you know? <laughs> and she woke up and she looked at the shirt and she said, it, can you put it on another color? I'm, no, no, no. We're only printing black shirts, you know? <laughs> so we, 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 we then, I had a client who had an NFL license. Uh, we all flew to New York. Um, we met with the NFL and they scolded him and they scolded me because he's like, you know what? I just gave this guy a license. Now you want to be licensed for something else. You haven't paid a penny in royalty. And, you know, we, you know, we went from being chest up, you know, to feeling very, very small. And as we were leaving the meeting, he said, Hey, look, I want you to uh, run this by our creative department. And it was at that moment that I knew we had something very, very unique, you know? So I showed it to the creative department. We came back and we said, well, we set our sights pretty high for the NFL. We weren't going to get the deal, but let's go and try and get college licenses. So, you know, actually it was 1987. So we actually uh, went out and licensed 38 schools. We did our first trade show at the, uh, at the, uh, NSG GA show in 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 uh, Chicago. You know what? I like to stay in a nice hotel, but we couldn't really afford it. So there were six of us in the hotel room, on one king bed, and a bunch of people sleeping on the floor. I bought a ten by ten booth, shipped it to Chicago, and we had our first show. And we walked into the McCormick Center, and we uh, went to find our booth, and we were at the secondary center in the basement, in the farthest place away. And wow. our mood went from, we're going to, we're going to rule the world to, oh my God. But as we were walking between the, the two convention centers, they did showcase our shirt in new product showcase. The show opened up. I got to tell you, it still gives me goosebumps. They were three, four deep. Nobody had ever seen printing like this before. I assembled 50, two salespeople, my own sales force, and, and, and we hit the ground running after the show. It didn't write a lot of business because you never do at shows, but, you know, it was right. great exposure. However, at the same time, there was a company, very young, aggressive sports licensing company called Salem Sportswear. Uh, their art director, their senior art director was walking the show. He saw our stuff, went back to the owner of the company and said, you know what, if you don't partner up with these guys, they'll put you out of business. They're that good. You know, so while we were trying to do our own thing from 88 to 90, we had a deal with the NFL. I had a partnership with the quarterback, Jim Kelly. I don't want to get to a whole lot of details of that. We were getting ready to go. We couldn't finalize a deal. And at the same time, I had Salem Sports were knocking on my door. And at the show in, I think, 1990, I went to Salem Sports where and said, I'm not going to be able to make this deal with the NFL. I'll partner up with you. Signed a deal that day. So thank God for the great folks at Salem Sportswear at the time. They taught me about business. They taught me about culture. They taught me about everything. And it was very, very lucrative, you know. So we were killing it. And, uh, you know, we were, every graphic that we did, you know, we've won, I think, 52 golden squeegees, you know, gold, silver, bronze. Uh, people, you know, we were voted the best, the most prestigious award that I ever got was 1993 or 1994 press magazine named the screen printer of the year, which was really awesome because uh, it was voted on by people within the industry. Right. And you know what, people started seeing what we were doing. And, and like I said, at that time, we really became an overnight sensation. It was during a, a, an interview with press magazine or screen print or something that they were like, well, what are you doing? You're, 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 you're doing four color process on black. And I said, no, 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 we're not. We're using high opaque colors. We're printing up to 12 colors on a shirt, but it's not four color process. I guess it's like a simulated process and we coined the phrase. So, you know, we invented, Dave and I, Dave invented it. I perfected it, meaning from a production standpoint and coined the word simulated process. And we rode that, 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 that wave and yeah, honestly we're still riding it oh know? man so, i mean when when i got in and i uh, started teaching in the industry i mean i taught a whole section a half a day for nine years i was you know teaching classes every single month 
And uh, it's kind of gives me goosebumps that you guys coined this, then started this process. And then here I am, you know, years later after I got in the industry teaching something that, you know, you guys developed. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it kind of cool. Amazing. It was amazing because one of the greatest thrills back then, and oh my God, we're talking about 30 years ago, you know, when we would go to trade shows, people knew us. It was so great to take my employees there. We had groupies. And I remember one show, probably 1990, you know, the king of, of, uh, of printing on dark garments was wild oats back then. They, they were, I was in the sports business. They were in the, the music business. They were working with all the big uh, music people. You know, there was Brockham on the East coast and, and obviously Winterland on the West Coast with Frank Vicani doing all that kind of spectacular work. And, you know, it's just like anything. Creative minds run parallel. So everybody was kind of doing the same thing, but Dave and I were doing it better. And Jerry Klaus, the owner of Wild Oats, came up and he had his entourage. And I'm talking about, we're not talking about small entourage. 20, 30 people would follow us around that show. Um, he said, the king is done, long live the new king. And then that was Jerry pulling out of the industry and us take, you know, going back in. So it was very interesting. Somewhere around, I think, 93, 94, we were actually, maybe even early, uh, a screen print show in LA where all the, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, uh, uh, not web designers, but, uh, you know, product designers for Apple. This was before there was Photoshop. And they were, we had us in a room trying to figure out what we did. They actually uh, automated the process of color separation, you know? So uh, right. we couldn't trademark it, you know, because it was not trademarkable, I don't think. And uh, pretty soon, you know, those seven days in a dark room for Dave Gardner turned into one day with Photoshop turns into what 30 minutes now, you know, to, right. to run a set program. So, uh, that's but, crazy. The difference to that, you know, the whole darkroom experience with film, you know, cut stencil using Ruby lith, you know, and today someone can spend what 800 bucks and press a button and <laughs> everything well, comes you, out. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's insane. You know, the short gap of time is not a lot of years, right? And the technology sure. is just, completely and now with you know direct to screen and you know the computer to screen technology it's gone even a step you know further than it was when i got into this industry oh, you know 15 years ago so it's but, uh you know the really interesting thing and, and, and there were a bunch of us walking around the iss show and looking at all the proposition out there and you know what there's a place for everything in this marketplace so i don't want to be misinterpreted you know I'm very good at what we do, which is simulated process. And when you look at a simulated process print, as opposed to a direct to garment print, it's like looking at digital music compared to vinyl. We're deeper, right. you know, uh, we're utilizing shirt color. You know, we're, we're, we're really deeper than that because you know, they're printing four color process on a white underbase, you know? Right. And people are learning how to manipulate that a little bit better, but you know what? I because we do what we do and because we do it so well, you know, it, it, and we'll get to that where we are today, you know, for a process that used to require 5,000 shirts, we're doing it at, at 72 to 144 is right now. Still gives that depth, still gives that artistic hands-on proposition, you know, because we, we looked at it, but I, I told my crew, stay in your lane. We're good at what we do. You know, we don't need to get distracted with, with digital right now. I'm sure someday we might get into it. But right now, just continue, you know. I always tell my team, stay in your lane. Absolutely. So kind of to fast forward, I mean, and I'm not going to speak for you here, but you kind of, you know, started where we started, hit the 90s, things take off. You know, I know yeah, so you had a large expansion. And yeah, let's, let's take it, you know, in 1995, I moved from my small building into a ground up uh, built that we did specifically for screen printing. I stood there with my wife before opening and said, I don't even know I'm going to fill it and then add it on three more times over the next three years. So, you know, it, 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 it 
we had a process nobody else could do. It was, mm -hmm. it was, and we were making, you know, tons of money, you know, I'd be perfectly honest with you. Uh, you know, numbers that I would quote that, you know, I'm talking, we're talking, Hey, look, you know what? My lesson to screen printers is don't do it for nothing, but we're talking about 1990. I was getting a dollar 50 a print wow. and I was printing hundreds of thousands. That's awesome. Right. So when we kind of exited out of the sports business because the sports consolidated and mm -hmm. the company that I was working with, Salem Sportswear, sold the fruit of the loom and they went bankrupt. I then during that time, I was uh, getting my feet wet in the rock and roll business and bringing our techniques and, and processes to rock and roll. And you know what? One thing led to another and we grew and we grew and we grew at 2007, you know, from a private label perspective, I really wanted to get into Nike and the big brands. Mm -hmm. uh, built a 100,000 square foot uh, facility in Honduras. Um, you know, by the time we were up and operating, between the two companies, we had 29 automatics. You know, we were doing 3 million shirts a month. And you know what? Every time you work with somebody new, you know, there's a new set of problems. And when I joined Ni Nike, it was the conversion uh, out of PVC to water base, which was mm -hmm. a whole other proposition that you had to learn. You know, I didn't really get with Nike until about 2010, but you know, and, and, and my bigger clients in Honduras, like Disney would come to me at that time and say, what's new? And I'd be like, well, water base, high solids acrylic is new. Well, is it going to cost us more money? And I said, sure. And they said, well, then we're not really interested into it, you know? But if you fast forward now, you know, we're, look, the reality is eventually the industry will go in that direction. Uh, digital will help push that because it's a sustainable ink process, you know, um, and there's nobody out there. So to kind of like segue into techniques and R&D and different things, um, Nobody is developing anything that's remotely interesting in a in a PVC free or a PVC world. You know, if you're a plastisol printer, you're going to get the same glitter ink that you got 15 years ago. And when you lay it down on a shirt through a 63 or an 83 mesh, or, you know, it's going to feel exactly like it feels caked on, horrid. At the same time, you, you know, so, so at the same time, you have the industry from the mid nineties moving into, from a, from a blank standpoint, moving into very, very complicated fabrics, you uh -huh. know, you know, back then I was printing, you know, when I was printing all the stuff in the nineties, it was made in America. It was pre NAFTA. It was this building weight, we were running 6.1 ounce open-ended yarns. We were running seven and a half ounce open-ended yarns, you know, and after that proposition died out, it got back into 50-50s. And hey, how about if we make a tri-blend? Hey, how about if we make 100% polyester? And, and all that stuff was happening at the same time that high solids acrylics were coming onto the scene, you know? So from my experience with Nike and you know, lucky me, I got the legends program for the NFL. So I didn't touch cotton. Everything that I was trying to develop had to be uh, PVC free on, on hundred percent poly, Jeez. not real easy, but never one to step away from a challenge. And because every, every R and D project, you know, I, I'll say that every R and D project that I work on doesn't normally turn out the way that I wanted it to. But every mistake that I learned along the way, you know, from doing that project was very commercial friendly, you know. Mm -hmm. So every miss turned into a hit, you know. Uh, it just needed to be re rethought of. Absolutely. So, and, and I will tell you that in printing every type of ink imaginable, conversion from plastisol to PVC back then was uber difficult. Now, a little bit easier, you know, inks are getting a little bit more advanced. Back then, you could never print wet on wet. Now, there's propositions that can print wet on wet, you know, so, but my point from a technique standpoint, oh, the best techniques are in water base. And, and, and if you think you're going to blow somebody's mind by doing it with an ink that has, uh, that's plastisol, it, it won't happen. The best techniques, the glitters, the foils, the, uh, color changing everything is so much better 
you know, water-based propositions. So you really need to understand that. When I teach people how to do it, I'm like, learn how to just print water base in a single color. You can go out and buy metallics. You can go out and buy glitters. You can do all this stuff. It's so much better. Learn that before you really try and do simulated process in a, in a high solids acrylic proposition. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm going to cut you off. We're going to go to a quick commercial break and we will be right back with Mr. John Weiss talking about uh, special effects printing, learning more about his journey and uh, more about uh, different ink types, which will be fun to dive back into here. We'll be right back. The revolutionary rock press foil automatic heat press station and foil application is a time and money saving solution for your automated garment decoration. The traditional cumbersome foiling process typically comes with a hefty price tag and labor and overhead to produce. The Rock Foil removes this from your expenses by automating the foil application process directly on press in line with your screen printing job. Taking advantage of this technology will undoubtedly give you and your shop an additional competitive edge in capability, price, and profit. For these items and other expert supplies, please visit rock.us, that's R-O-Q dot U-S, or call 1-877-ROCK-IT-NOW, that's 1-877-674-8669. So I want to welcome everybody back to today's episode featuring the topics of foil, special effects, and simulated process and screen printing. We're joined by Mr. John Weiss of New Buffalo Shirt, alongside of uh, Meryl Caps here, our creative director at Rock US. Hello, hello. And uh, we're going to dive back into uh, John's journey and uh, talk more about ink, special effects printing, and, and what he's doing now. So welcome cool. back, John, and uh, we'll kind of kick back up kick with back in where we were, yeah, where your there. company was going, and um, and how that kind of transitioned into where you are now. Yeah, so you know, briefly, uh, we got involved with Nike. We started really learning the ins and outs of high solids acrylic printing. Um, during that time, um, I during that time. Um, uh, Gildan was Gildan Anvil, who was my supplier in Honduras, uh, was doing all the basics for Nike. They went out to Nike. And Nike said, you know, we're really not too interested in having a, a blank supplier. We'd like to have a, a full package supplier. So in a meeting in 2013, uh, the Gildan executives were out at Nike and, you know, they kind of asked, who should we buy? And, and one of the senior guys at Nike uh, said, well, if you're going to buy anybody, you should buy it within our supply chain. You should buy New Buffalo because they have both domestic and offshore propositions. So within a very short period of time, Gildan bought my company in, in 2013. And, wow. uh, it's you a know, huge I stayed, accomplishment. Yeah, and I stayed on uh, for two and a half years. Uh we all know the story of selling your company to a publicly traded company. When you're a true entrepreneur, it's very difficult to make the conversion to, uh, to corporate. Uh, it was particularly hard for me. And uh, we decided to part ways in 2015. Uh, very fair company and, and uh, great, great brand. Um, I then sat out for a year on a non-compete and then uh, reopened in 2000 and end of 2016 as believe it or not new buffalo shirt it shocks everybody at gildan but gildan really never wanted to be looked upon as being in the printed business because they sell right. the majority of this stuff to printers so they never bought the name they only bought the assets so i asked and they said i don't care go use your name again and we started up uh, uh, New Buffalo Shirt. We dropped the factory part because we're certainly not a factory. We're a studio right now. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes explaining that process and then move into the technique uh, stuff. Yeah, so, that's awesome. And I, I love the word that you, you took the factory off and mm -hmm. studio. Yeah. And that kind of brings well, me to that question of, you know, you obviously after selling your company, I mean, 
lots of people will do lots of different things, right? I'm going to retire, I'm going to go do this or whatever the case may be. And, and you came right back. I mean, literally. Well, not quite, not quite. Okay. You know, I, I had a year off uh, non-compete and during that time and, 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 and we have a great brand name or we had a great brand name in the industry. So, you know, when everybody heard that I was selling to Gildan and that we eventually closed down our domestic factory, the big Nike printers would spend days in Buffalo soliciting help. And, you sure. know, everybody, everybody who really wanted to get a job could have a job. They were very highly recruited. Um, my phone never rang. And I was sitting there on the sidelines, really kind of, I must have read eight books on retirement. And, and, and here's the problem. And this is a lesson of work-life balance to everybody that's a shop owner out there. We spent so much time at work. You know, I'd work 80 hours a week. My only friends were outside of my family, my employees. And, and right. we had a tremendous, tremendous culture there. But when it came time to retire, you know, I felt kicked to the curb. Mm -hmm. and, and I really was kind of hurt through the process that all these people are getting great job offers. My phone never rang, probably mm -hmm. because people thought, thank God he cashed out. And, but, but during the time, and I've been doing this for 50 years, I have no hobbies. I'm a terrible... I, I could barely mow the lawn, you know, uh, you know, I'm just not mechanically inclined. I don't like to fish. I like to snowboard and surf. And surfing was quite recent, but you, you know, you can't live like that. And so during the, the uh, non-compete time, a couple of old employees came to me and said, we have these great offers. I got to pick up my family. I got to move to Virginia. I got to move to South Carolina. I got to do this. I don't want to go anywhere. And they said, would you be interested in helping us do a restart? And I said, yeah, there's, there's a, a number of things and a number of stories about you wish you didn't say something at that time, but you know, we're human. We could change our mind. I said, yeah, I'll get into it with you. I'll, I'll help you finance the company. I'll, I'll help you. I'll give you my, uh, I'll use my old clients and, and we'll go out and we'll buy a couple of rocks. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this thing works. And, and, uh, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just an amazing re-entry into it because I, I guess I couldn't retire, but I really didn't want to come back in because I got burned out. I had 1,200 employees. You know, I was right. manu managing production and I burned out. So given an opportunity to change directions and really kind of sell and talk for a living as opposed to be on press and print, um, it was interesting. I didn't know really how it was going to work out. Um, and it worked out beyond my wildest expectations. So what, what, what is New Buffalo shirt? like focused on? Like if you were to kind of like round it out, because obviously, you know, you grew this giant business right through the 80s and into selling in 2000 i think 14 is what you said yeah 13 um, sure. 13 um and now you you kind of get back into it so what's what's the focus now like what what did you come back to to do and what is new buffalo really focused on just in terms of a business well for all the listeners out there you know i'm a i'm a heavy reader you know i spent lots of time on airplanes going back and forth to Honduras. I would go to Honduras every other week for almost seven years. Um, I read a book by an author, Simon Sinek. He's a business uh, guy and it was the leadership of why. Mm -hmm. And I started to really try and understand why did I do this all to begin with? And it, it narrowed me down into the passion and, and, and it turned me right back to the art reproduction side. I am an artist. Okay. I, I, I was a painter. I don't paint anymore. Uh, one of the issues that I had for the one semester of college that I went to in art school was I'm a realist. 
And, uh, you know, and I, I, I'm not an abstract kind of guy. So when I looked at an apple, I wanted to paint an apple. And if right. I could get that apple as close to a, a photograph, then I'm a good artist. Screen printing is exactly that. You know, screen Absolutely. printing is an abstract. Screen printing is one of the great uh, reproductive art forms out there. My job is to make it look as close to original as I can. I do take liberties now, you know, but back then, you know, it, it, it just worked for me. And in the process of building a big company, it become became a commodity-based business. You know, when you're working big contracts with Disney and Nike and Adidas, they dictate to you what the price is. And you have to try and figure out how to make margin by volume. Mm -hmm. And that was the burnout part. So, you know, when you jump back into it, we decided it's, it's all just wordplay, obviously. We decided to drop the factory because we weren't one. And new Buffalo Shirt Studio didn't really sound good. And our website has always just been New Buffalo Shirt. So we just kind of dropped the factory, even though I think legally we still are New Buffalo Shirt Factory. And we told everybody they weren't press operators. You know, you weren't a press operator. You weren't a production manager. You weren't a catcher. You weren't a folder. We're all artisans. We're artists. That's what we try and promote there. That's awesome. You know what? So we're artistic. So what did we do and what do we focus on? We have a big shop mentality. You know, we work with the biggest brands in the world, which gives us credibility. When you're working for every major rock and roll act, when you're working with Nike, Disney, Adidas, uh, at times Under Armour and all these people, you know, you know their ins and outs, you know their QC, you know everything about it. You know what we understood in order to try and be profitable, we had to try and automate every step of the proposition. So early on, we were being very sustainable, recycle, you know, re reclamation recycle units, you know, <clears throat> direct to screen, automatic squeegee coders, all that stuff that is necessary when you're a big volume printer. We just took that big volume printer mentality and really, really reduced it to a two press shop. So we gotcha. understand the ins and outs of brand uh, awareness um, and we continue to have the same peace of mind attitude with our music clients, you know, that you can't miss a show. Everything that we learned with a big shop, we just reduced down. And that's where our business model is, is very, very interesting because of our big shop experience. So, you know, so you've that, taken that and kind of focused more on the innovation than more on the craft. Well, not necessarily, more... necessarily the innovation, but, but particularly the making money aspect of the uh, proposition, you know, repricing, you know, getting back into number of colors plus number of shirts equal your price. You know, this flat line pricing will only kill you. Oh, geez, I'm a contract printer. I print for 50 cents. You know, some of the, some of the uh, uh, quotes that, that I hear out in the industry doesn't even cover overhead and ink, but you know right. what? We're not the smartest people in the, in, in the world of screen printers. And, you know, hopefully I get a chance to educate them from an experience standpoint. But yes, we did take it down because one of the things I always remembered saying in the wonderful world of rock and roll is that the deliveries would be literally 24 hours. And you, you know, if you didn't like something, you had no luxury of taking it down. And I made sure that our new business model revolved around quality. And if you don't like it, we don't ship it. It just, you know, and we've taken what used to be you know, my sweet spot uh, from a profit standpoint was close to 200 dozen before we'd actually make decent money. And we've changed our model. So our sweet spot's 144 shirts. And the industry says, wow, I can get 12 colors in process and 144 shirts. Yeah, you're going to pay a lot. But you know what? Everything's changed. And Lots of That's our clients are kind of how you're setting yourself apart too. I mean, I, I obviously come from the industry as well. Now I'm on the other side of it, you know, at rock, but you know, came into it as, as a printer and uh, I was in LA and, you know, it was always a struggle because I could throw a rock in any direction and hit another screen printing shop. Sure. And just like you're saying with, you know, the 50, 50 cents a print or dollar a print or people, you know, that are just charging these flat rates, I'll do anything for five bucks a shirt. It doesn't matter, right? It's, you know, you've got to come, you've got to approach it 
in a different way. And I think that, you know, for me, that's what I've seen you guys do is, is really focusing on that craft on different processes on getting really obviously good at flock, which you started, you know, years ago, obviously it's kind of how you got into this industry sure. and offering something different to these people allows you to command that higher, Special. you know, price yeah. on 144 garments and someone's willing to pay it because it's not, it's not a shirt anymore. It's a piece of art. It's something different. Sure. Right. Sure, and, and, and you know what, Through, I will say this, and I will challenge anybody out there. We are the best flockers in the country. You know, our flock is better than anything, including heat transfer flock, primarily because we do it three times a week. And, and you know what, when I was flocking in Honduras and flocking for Disney, we would have to wall off with paper from rafters all the way down to enclose that press. So we, out of our 17 machines down there, uh, we'd have one roped off. We'd be fl hand flocking for Disney, right, with the wands. And the other brands like Nike and Adidas would come in and go, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're, you're getting flocked everywhere. So, you know, one of the driving uh, reasons why I went and went to Esrock, you know, primarily big ovals for water-based printing, but techniques and, and flock. If you walk through my shop on a flock day, you'd never know I'm flocking. Everything's contained. And the beauty part of flock and the process, and if you understand the business, whether it's flock or inline foil, you can charge a lot of money for it. That makes it easy to back in your standard screen print, you know, and there were one of my largest clients now, uh, we opened the door with Flock. And you know what? And then we just went in because you know what? With New Buffalo, you know what? Don't open the door a little bit because we'll bust right through and we'll take a lot of business. And, and, and we do, you know? So we use Flock as an entree. You know, we used inline foil as an entree. And you know what, once we get them in there, they're always like, well, what else can you do? And then we blow them away with all the new stuff that we're working on and all the new R&D stuff and all the, you know, and, 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 and I gotta tell you I, I, on the side, if any screen printer knew what I was billing, you know, they, they, they'd be so jealous because, you know, screen printers don't know how to bill. They just don't, not yeah. the big ones anyways. And that, you know, and if you're not making money, you don't have uh, enough money to reinvest. And one thing we've always done is reinvest in our company. You know, we want the best equipment. You know, we want, you, you know, that's what we do. So, you know. Well, I appreciate you saying you want the best equipment and you're running rock. So that was an awesome uh, uh, yeah. I, I will tell plug you for us. I appreciate it. That when I bought my first rock ovals and... 2013 2014 you know i lost a lot of friends at the competition we're all friends now i'm, I'm happy to say that we're, we're, we're all friends because life is too short um but you know what your equipment has done me well it has done me very very well and then very excited with the new proposition rock us because you know what we need good technical support and 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 everything but you know what i've been running your machines now for close to four years and I will tell you, I've never had a registration problem and uh, never expect to have one. So uh, awesome. they do a really Fantastic. good job. We're, we're, you know, I, and I will tell you, you know, that, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, I take a video and send it to you because, you know, there's certain parts of a rock press that make more sense than any other press, you know, that didn't when I was buying them. One pin for the squeegee and flood bar saves a ton of time. And I'm one of those guys who will change pallets, you know, three or four times a day. And I will tell you, my girls who are my, pre you know, I have a lot of women working for me, way more women than I have men. Um, they don't even stop the indexer. They're changing pallets that fast. That's awesome. And, and, and I can't tell you the time saving in that, you know, I mean, you know, look, we're a, sm we're a short run shop. I can go from 144 pieces with flock to 72 pieces of eight colors to, you, you know, uh, to youth, to ladies. And, and we're not spending all this time trying to change palettes. 
You know, I, you know, hey, look, what do we boast? Well, what we boast and what we're comfortable with is three to, you know, so I did time studies. So, you know, I sat there with a stopwatch and, you know, the way that I timed it, because, you know, screen printers said, oh, how many shirts you print an hour? Hey, 800 shirts an hour. Well, well, you don't, okay? Because you're not taking into consideration any of your downtime or anything like that. But I sat with a stopwatch for a day and we got it down to, this is the way we timed. You, we started the stopwatch when the last shirt of that job hit the dryer belt. Gotcha. So we're taking into consideration breaking down. Now, mind you, there's three people who are trained well, breaking down, setting the next job up, and and I would time them to the first good shirt down the dryer. And the average on the day was four minutes of screen. Okay. That's because awesome. we had to have that data so we could schedule better. Mm-hmm. So if you got a six color job, we allow 25 minutes from the end of the first job to the second job coming down. I think we can do two or three, but we're not there yet. Honestly, we're, we're four to five minutes and that's how we book. our. It's still impressive though. Oh, I no mean, doubt. you're talking to the first good shirt coming coming on i mean that's that's impressive right. but i'm also talking about your trilock system is dead nuts on you know what uh, we've incorporated that trilock into our direct to screen imager you know what uh, we do is it perfect it's never perfect you know it, because it's manual how do i put the screen on the trilock and how do i put the screen in my digital but you know what my people kind of almost know now which way it has to go and they're quick and they're good. And you know what? That's a tribute to you guys because you know, I've you, Hey, look, you put a, a, a rock honeycomb pallet in a groove. I don't have to pull out a pallet locator. I pop a screen. I put my tri lock on there. I put the next screen in. It's perfect. Off I go, you know, because there's no variation of where that pallet is located. So, you know, one of the great things about rock, by the way, Awesome. Thank you. We're going to take another quick break and we will be back with John Weiss to continue our conversation. Do you like to flock? I sure do. The Rock Flock 4060 Automatic Flocking Station is your apparel decorating trendsetter. The first fully integrated and multiple screen printing flock application unit for an automatic screen printing press. The Rock Flock allows your shop to automate the flock process for one to four colors and includes a cleaning vacuum station which ensures the flock is presentable for sale quality to each of your customers each and every time. For more information, please visit rock.us. I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we discuss all things screen printing. Today's episode features the topic of foil, special effects, and simulated processes in screen printing. We are joined by John Weiss of New Buffalo Shirt. Alongside of me here is Mr. Merrill Caps, our creative director. Thank you all. I do have a quick sort of unrelated question before we dive into the final place. Um, John, you were telling us over the break and everybody has to hear how cool it is. Uh, you have to introduce everyone to your guitar collection because it's epic. Well, and just so our viewers that are just listening know, John's sitting in front of Gorgeous. About five, guitars. and I know there's more in here, but five guitars very strategically, beautifully hung on his yeah. wall. So please uh, tell us everything. Smoke and mirrors, guy. You know what? <laughs> Look, when I was uh, printing domestically, you know, one of my goals in life was to print for rock and roll, right? And uh, so, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, 1996, I get a cold call answer the phone woman on the other line goes you i know you you don't know me and i have a new company a new startup and i have a band you might be interested in working with and i said well who's the band and she said the rolling stones and i'm like you've got to be kidding me her office in, was in new york i'm like when can i come can i come tomorrow you know <laughs> that's awesome and within a couple of days i flew in there because rock and roll is really my passion you know because there's nothing quite like being at a venue and seeing people buy your stuff. And, and, mm-hmm. and from that standpoint, you know, so I'll, I'll continue the story. So we make a deal with the Rolling Stones and I get everybody very, very focused on it. And, and we weren't going to fail, you know, and, 
and we got all our product done before the first date. The first date was in Chicago, blah, blah, blah. You know, it started me collecting guitars because the very first guitar I collected is that bass Stratocaster right in the middle that was signed by Keith Richards. Um, and, and, and I got to tell you, when I, and, and we were always a very generous uh, company because we were family. Everybody there was family. And so we decided to have a company party. We took the entire staff to the Rolling Stones at, at the stadium, you know. Now, you can bet that standing outside, it was the Bridges of Babylon tour, standing outside the stadium looking at the merch stands and you see your work everywhere, Jeez. you know, they felt, they felt great. And, and it paid off in dividends. So, you know what? So, so basically, when I'd find an act that I'd really like, I would talk to my road guy and, and see if I could get a signature and what kind of guitar was played. And you know what? Behind me is from there to the other side. That one's signed by Joe Walsh. The one next to it's from a wonderful Canadian band called The Tragically Hip. Then we have Keith Richards. Then we have David Gilmore from Pink Floyd, and the last one is Buddy Guy. Um, Buddy Guy. You know, it's funny. There, you can cut this out. It really doesn't matter. But you know, the story on David Gilmore is he's playing at Radio City Music Hall, and I got to New York, and the merchandise manager called me and said, "Did you bring the guitar?" I'm like, "What guitar?" Is David signing for you. And so I had to run all over downtown Manhattan trying to find a guitar. Now, I didn't know what David Gilmore played, and I was with a musician friend. And we walk into a guitar store, and that guitar was in a, in a glass cabinet right in the center of the store. I said, you have to sign a, uh, settle a bet for us. What kind of guitar does Gilmore play? And he goes, well, that's easy. And he walked me over to the glass showcase, and there was a picture of Gilmore and that guitar. Oh, wow. And I said, I got to buy it. I said, I got to buy it. And he said, I'm not selling that guitar. I'm like, look, I was relentless. I got to buy it. I got to buy it. He said, why do you have to buy that guitar? And I said, because David, as you know, is at Radio City Music Hall tonight, and he's going to sign it. He says, it's yours. <laughs> and he sold wow. it. Wow. So, you know, it's very cool. So, it. That's you fortuitous, know, it, right? You just <laughs> randomly pick a place, and that happens to be the guitar. <laughs> yeah, so, So you know what? The guitar collection, which is – around every wall here and then there's some at my factory also because i think all in all there might be 15 of them um you nice. know they used to be in my my lobby of my big factory and it was wonderful because i would never say a word i know the story behind it i bought the guitars and i had somebody sign them but you know when a client walks in and oh my god they would always say, you know slash you know, Angus Young and I would just smile. I don't, you know, uh, but, but you know what? I'm not going to tell him I did or I didn't. I would just say, yeah, they signed my guitars. <laughs> you know? And it gave me, it gave me rock star status, right? You know, that's so awesome. It, 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 it's great. That's awesome. Printing on rock for rock. I like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Printing on yeah, rock Yeah, I was the one rock. with Bobby that's that cute. said, we will rock you. We will rock you S. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, that's, a big idea. that's awesome. I'm sure it wasn't a real, uh, it wasn't original at the time, but you know. So I, I want to kind of like maybe get some advice for you for the people that are listening and just um, the, the question are, what are ways that current screen printers can learn to perfect their craft? So like, what do you recommend, you know, the audience listening do to really dive in get their feet wet with what they're doing. Remember the art, right, side of this and learn to expand that horizon so they're not charging, you know, 50 cents a print if that's not what they want to do. I mean, you know, most folks out there I know want to make lots of money. They'd probably love to sell their business one day for, you know, seven, eight, nine figures, you know, whatever the case may be. I mean, we all get into business for, you know, that aspiration of, the sky's the limit. So in screen printing, how do people learn how to perfect that? How do people dive into the craft in a different kind of way? Well, you know that old joke, right? How do you get to uh, Radio City? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> um, it, it, it's something that, that you cannot discount. You know, it doesn't really matter how good you are. You know, it, it's kind of funny. 
and I hope you don't mind mentioning some names in the industry. Um, there are, in my opinion, you know, and I don't want to insult anybody, but in my opinion, there are two or three types of, of printers. You know, I try and focus in on the art of screen printing, but there are, and, and you know what, from the legends that I know, they are on one hand. So when we go out to the shows and we're talking, it's very interesting because everybody's about technology. You know, the young screen printers, what they want to know is how do I do it? What mesh? What's my emulsion over mesh? What mesh counts? You know, what line screen are you running? Uh, blah, 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 blah. And if you ever sit in any of the Pepe Quaglia uh, seminars on water-based printing, he comes out and says, I'm, I'm not going to give you that information because it's much like uh, having a GPS on your car. If somebody's instructing you every step of the way and I take your GPS and it all, and I say, go back and do it, you weren't paying attention, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I tell people how to get here, you have to go on your own journey, you know? It, it, you can't have an easy answer because chances are it probably won't work in your shop anyways. For example, inline foil. Well, what foil adhesive do you use? What I use may not work for you, you know, you, you know, or, or what kind of flock are you running? Or, you know, I know people who had after, after um, I was doing a lot of flock work for hard rock, uh, other suppliers of hard rock went out and, and, and bought flocking machines, you know, did they have the discipline to get past the learning curve? Or did they get frustrated like I did years ago and said, this ain't what, oh, I'm sorry, this ain't working. And you know what, I'm going to go back to wand flocking, you know. I mean, it takes courage, right? It takes know-how, it takes discipline, and it takes failure. But what I'm here to tell people is that with every job that we do in, 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 in R&D, we're always going to find something that absolutely blows our mind are we satisfied with the end product no but what little thing happened i'll give you an example i was trying to do four color process you know high solids four color process and i was just winging it right i'm not a really good four color process printer but i can do it and then i just started changing bases and i started laying down pearl under bases and glitter under bases and you know what, I'll tell you, you know, because it's a true story. This past January, I was on the considering whether I should go into the digital world. Now, it, this isn't for it, one way or the other. So I had my sample bag and I went out and saw probably five big clients. And, and what I had was all the beautiful digital work. And then I had blocks and foils and what I was doing, printing over glitter under bases and four color process and everything. And I, I, I honestly didn't get anybody going, wow, I love that digital stuff. Right. It's not to say there's not a market for it, just to say that my client, you, you know, I took this thing to a client who I knew was going to be a home run and he didn't even get excited about it. He was like, wow, flock, wow, <laughs> foil, Man. you know, Look at that. I went and showed the whole proposition to uh, Live Nation, but it was the other screen printed stuff in my bag that they were very interested in. Hey, can we get a sample of this? Can we get a sample of that? Which is why I came back and told the team, at this particular time, it's really good to just stay in our lane and let's redevelop. So we, then we started saying, okay, how far can we push four color process over pearl bases? And they were fantastic. Now, are they awesome? No, but can I go out and sell a client how to use this technique in their design process, which is very, very critical in here, you know? So as a contract printer, I really don't create art. So I go meet with my client's art departments and I say, look at all this great stuff. Don't ever make it a primary, make it a secondary, you know? It's never right. cool to put big type foil letters. It's much better to use accents of foil, accents of flock, accents of this technique or that technique you know because when it becomes primary it's really going to put you in the poorhouse i won't mention client 
or I won't, but I, but I will mention that the client specifically called out um, uh, 3M Reflective Ink. And we're very, very understanding of what our costs are. And I'll tell you, the reason why I did it and probably the rest of the supply chain didn't is because I'm the only guy who understood the cost. And I said, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Oh, money's no object until they get the invoice. I had it on, on, a, <laughs> on a back of a sweatshirt. I literally had a dollar sixty-three of reflective ink on it. Dollar sixty-three. That's before I mark it up. That's before I charge for my print. Dollar sixty-three. You know, right. I think this stuff was coming in at three and a half, four dollars a print. Um, that's part of the R and D process. You know, look, if you're out there expecting somebody to tell you how to do it, you. You know what? It's like making money. If somebody came up to you and gave you a million dollars or you had a chance to make a million dollars, what would you appreciate more? You know, mm -hmm. uh, I right. think I'd appreciate the fact that I earned it. And that's the same way with technique printing. It's the same way with R&D, which we're big on. Uh, you know, we talked about it. We're, we're initiating it again now, now that we're in a different position. I do samples on Saturday. And what I do is I go in with my crew. It's voluntary. But it's, a, it's not necessarily, it, it, it serves two purposes. The first purpose is we get the samples done and it doesn't have to interfere because we don't have a sample department. So it doesn't interfere with our daily production, which is a win. And the second thing is it's just a teaching Saturday. So any of, because we don't hire screen printers. We never have. I, I, I was telling somebody, I, I count on one hand out of the thousands of people who have gone through my doors that there might have been five people who came with screen print experience because we like to teach it. We like to teach the art of screen printing because there's more buy-in and we do that every Saturday while we're doing samples and we learn about inks and we learn about setups and we learn about, you know, because when we're doing sample Saturday, some of our clients are asking for stuff we never did before and we're mm -hmm. learning. But the best right. part about R and D and the best lesson is, you learn from your mistakes and your mistakes you can commercialize into something that you never even dreamt of before. It was right. like, huh, I didn't even know we could do that. I didn't know that was the result of that. Okay. Can we control it? And can we, can we commercialize it? And we can, because you know what, there's a, a lot of award winning stuff, you know, that, and, and stuff that would blow your mind that you can do one or two of, but you know, we have to take it like, we tint metallic inks, but we tint it with transparent process colors over it. So we sell and we've sold a ton of it, almost like an ombre metallic. Well, how do you do it? By running cyan and magenta in a very transparent thing over, over a, a, a silver metallic underbase. Brilliant. Okay. I'll go to the creative departments and tell them how to do this and how to work it into their design. And, and, and we sell tons of it. And we get good margin. You know, anytime we get out of the normal ink on shirt, you know, we get good margin. So I, I, I do encourage people to R&D, you know, to learn. If you, if you have it, if, if you want to be a screen printer, nobody's going to come in and teach you how to do that. And even if they do, the minute they walk out the door, and believe me, I had an offshore company, I know exactly what it is, you know. We would R&D Nike. Our job was to R&D Nike in the United States. I had a great staff in Honduras. The minute I took it down, sat down to Honduras and went down there, they weren't following the recipe. So they're not listening anyways, right? right. You've got to create your proposition. You've got to learn. It's trial and error. And you know what? If you have to embrace the proposition, it's not the end result. It's the process. And if you embrace the process, you'll get not at your first time, perhaps not at your second or third time, but by your fourth time, you're going to learn and you're going to appreciate the fact that you put that kind of effort into it and you're going to be proud of your results. So it kind of sounds like people just shouldn't be afraid to try. People should go out and buy inks and processes and things that they've never played with. Experiment, play with it. It kind of drove me back to, you know, a lot of folks are afraid of water base and you're like, just get one color burn a screen, sure. learn how to do that well, and then it's expand a on it. You got to develop the disciplines. But you know what? At the same time, if your business model doesn't call for it, 
then don't do it. You know, I've talked to printers. They're very, you, you know, look, you get into the industry for a number of reasons, right? Reason number one, you're an online marketer. I see this all the time. You have an exploding brand and your contractors, you don't know the first thing about screen printing, but your contractors are letting you down. So you talk to a salesman who convinces you that you need to buy a press and you're a screen printer. Those type of people don't, don't try an R&D, right? right? You might have somebody else who, who I talked to that was in the awards business that, or, or you're in the ad specialty business, you know, and it's not asking for anything like that. So you have to be very happy in your lane. But when right. you're in my lane of we're not a factory, we're a studio, we're actually a reproductive screen print studio, and I want to bring to my client base new and innovative things, we have to R&D, and we have to use techniques. And, and you know, techniques can be anything from flock and foil. It can be just your print technique, like the stuff I was showing you earlier, playing around with new ink technologies, understanding their opacities and don't be afraid to to try things because you know i can't tell you how many times i go in and 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 again we have some people you know my my employees have been printing for 10 to 15 years and and they'll come in on a saturday and i know what they're thinking well this is never going to work you know the last project i worked on i told my client i have no idea if it's going to work and we did one and honestly i thought it was awesome okay cool. i showed it to the ink manufacturers i showed it to the client and the client who's a fine artist said uh i'm not sure and and you know then you're 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 running that thing of well what is he trying to tell me to do you know and mm -hmm. and 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 he said well i need it to pop and i'm printing in discharges and water bases he said yeah he said, well maybe you should put a white screen underneath it. And that's when I lost it, you know? And I'm like, look, dude, you're, you're a fine artist. And if I commissioned you and stood over your shoulder and told you how to paint, you'd kill me. I said, please don't tell me my trade. Tell me what you don't like. And then you have to try and figure out what exactly it is that they're really referring to, pop. But I'm always up for a challenge. I got a little irate and, and kind of let my ego take over. And then I apologize. And then I apologized again and I'm still apologizing. But at the end, you saw the result earlier of what we did. It was brand new technology. Everybody said it's not going to work. Well, I don't know that because I'm not a technical screen printer. I'm an artistic screen printer. There's only a handful of us left. You know, I don't know who, who the young people in the industry have a tendency to migrate towards. Because mine takes work and discipline like an artist and everybody else is just looking for Betty Crocker to give them the recipe and it's not going to yeah. work. You know what? In, in my world of, of rock and roll, I can give the same separations to four different companies and they'll have four different shirts. I can guarantee you it's, you know, the, it, the art is just not that consistent. So Absolutely. what I encourage people to do is to really go out and just have some fun if you're a screen print artist. However, if you're a screen print technician and, and everything has to happen for a reason, then this is where you're gonna be and you probably won't ever get anything uh, incredible because you never could take off the blinders of what that, you know, when you're thinking about, well, that ink can only push through that mesh, you know? Right, right. So you gotta experiment. Absolutely. Right so, well, We've been uh, cruising, man. This has been awesome. Um, I wanted to kind of wrap up here and just wanted to give you an opportunity for our listeners. Uh, if you could tell them kind of where to find you online, Instagram, Facebook, if you've got any of that. Uh, so people can kind of check and... out, you know, I, I, your stuff. I, I'm so old school that I don't, you know, and my website, we really, you know what, we've been so busy that we really haven't paid a whole lot of attention to it. But you know what, you can find out about our company at, at www.newbuffaloshirt.com. Uh, got any questions for me, it's really easy. I'm at J-W-E-I-S-S -S at newbuffaloshirtfactory.com. You can tell from this podcast that one of the things I'm very passionate about is talking and also uh, and also screen printing. And you know what, I, I had a gut check 
I'm 65 years old. I had a gut check about a year ago and, and, and decided that I want to leave a legacy. You know what? What is my legacy? I want to be that guy as we did in, in Portugal last year, you know, who I bring a different kind of proposition to the table. You can find a lot of screen printers that are going to tell you how to print. I'm not going to do that. You know, I will never do that. However, I can tell you how to innovate. I can tell you how to be profitable. You know, that's where my passion really lies now. So if I can, and uh, last but certainly not least, as you guys know from Rock and I know from years and years, you know, I, I'd like to really leave the industry in a cleaner proposition than I joined. You know, I spoke earlier about having xylene poisoning. You know, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. But when I started to write a paper about it in the 2000s and, and, and looked at it, I, 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 the, the same symptoms of, of petty mal seizure happens with, uh, you know, uh, xylene poisoning. And I used to bathe in this stuff, oh, you know. Wow. So I'd like to leave it cleaner. I love, you know, right now, the, most of the product that I'm presenting to new brands is 100% organic cotton. I understand that really well. I understand your proposition at all made, you know, uh, it, it, it's time to do the right thing as screen printers. And you know what? Here's my last thing. If you wait for the American government to legislate that you have to take your plastics out of your inks, you're out of business because you know what? It's too late. Everybody else has a head start on you. Mm -hmm. And believe me when I tell you Absolutely. through the removal of lead, and then the removal of thiolates, that it's not too far away where they're just going to say, hey, it's unfair because it's PVC and it's everywhere. But we don't have big lobbying groups in Washington, D.C. talking about ink and everything. So <laughs> right. sooner or later, when they have to throw something to the people who are driving sustainability, you know, they'll tell us plasticizers are no good anymore. Solvent-based inks are no good anymore. You know what? Get ahead of it now, team, because... If you wait until it's legislated, you've waited too long. Absolutely. And I know we're going to continue working with John on a lot of different things from an education standpoint. Uh, you can typically find him somewhere around our booth at, at at least Long Beach uh, to, to chat. Um, Perhaps even on the road. There's a Long yeah. Beach, right? Yeah. Well, let's hope there's a Long Beach and another Portugal, which uh, was a really exciting trip that we oh, did that last that was awesome. Year. You know, it was... You know what, when we sat and we had, what did we have, Ross, about 32 printers there? Yeah, yeah. You know what, and we socialized and we sat in seminars and we had fun. And we ate a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really, really a lot of fun for me. You know, I, I thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was great. It was great. And if you could do that again, you know, we're working, there's a, couple of us old uh, KG veterans uh, working on a, a proposition that maybe we'll launch at this year's ISS. We call ourselves the Yarn Spinners. Uh, we have the web domain, but we haven't really put the proposition together. It's a collective group of people from different aspects of the industry that just love to tell stories because I think I teach best when I'm telling a story. I love Absolutely. that. I think I think probably change your name to John the Wise instead of Weiss. I, I like no, Weiss, no, but we, it's we can, John we, Wise. We, we, we can we we can leave. Well, actually, in German, it does translate that way. Weiss translates to wisdom, but uh, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just an old windbag who loves to push ink through mesh with a squeegee. That's all you know. Like and, and 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 I will say in closing that you know what the industry has been. Un I. You know, if you would have asked me when I was younger, did I ever think I'd be sitting here at 65 years old doing that? Not in my wildest dreams did I ever think it was going to end this way. I lived the dream of an entrepreneur. I started a small company, hand printing. I grew it to a bigger company. I invented a process that got me noticed. I marketed that process. I grew it. I grew it. Hey, believe me, you know what? There were times that I hit the mat two or three times where I thought I was going to be knocked out and thought there was no way up, but we're resilient people and, and, and we survived. And then at the end, you sell the company. So really, you know, 
it, it, you can retire. But again, you know what, what I bring to the table, the best asset that I bring to the table in New Buffalo Shirt is that I don't really do it for money. So I, it, 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 my decisions aren't based about whether I have to make payroll or not. That's my partner's proposition. But I've <laughs> learned, I've learned the power of no. And you know mm. what? The more times you say no, the more times your client goes, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, they're dumbfounded. So you know what? You don't have to acquiesce to every request they have. And you don't have to try and hit their target price because you know what? They, they negotiate just to negotiate. If That's you're good... Right charge mm -hmm. and if you can turn it into a business model congratulations oh, you were awesome i want to give a huge thanks to our special guest john weiss of new buffalo shirt for participating today as always thank you for spending time with us this week tune in next week or at your convenience on wherever you listen to your podcast by searching rock shop talk that's r-o-q shop talk on our next show, we'll discuss the Women Rock Movement, celebrating women in business and how to get involved. If you'd like to join the live Zoom hangout or even request to be on the show, please visit rock.us forward slash rock shop talk. That's R-O-Q dot U-S forward slash R-O-Q shop talk. If you found today's episode helpful, the greatest accolade we could ask for is for you to recommend it to a friend who you think may find it helpful as well. Please like, share, subscribe on social media. Until next time, rockers, press onward. <laughs>